Yeah, for me, that's all it's about. That's all it's about. I had I just got in a fight with someone the other night. I was talking to a voice teacher, and he was like, he was like, what? My students talk about you all the time, and I tell them just to go in and just sing. All they got to do is just sing. And I'm like, no, that's wrong. You can't tell them that. And I was like, you can't tell them that. That's wrong. I mean, we really want to see the actor. You know, I mean, we can hear voices anywhere we want. We didn't even have to come that day if that's all we really wanted to see. We could have done it all on YouTube. You know what I mean? But for me, I want to see someone, whether you have saying gimme, gimme for a million, a million times, I want to see someone come in like it's the first time and they're all discovering it for the first time and it's new and they're choosing their words and, it's, and it feels like it's just for me, just right now in this moment. You know, that is, that is a mini performance. And they need to get lost in what they're doing, not think about what I'm thinking. Not think about what I'm thinking or what I'm writing. You know what I mean? Or why I'm looking down, you know? I might be writing, call back, love her. Right. But that's what they're worried about? That's when I can go, oh, never mind. We've got better. WHB, people write down the bottom of resumes all the time. WHB, we have better. We have better. Traditional musical theater, pre-60s, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Rodgers and Hart, Lerner and Lowe, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, all that. Then there is contemporary, to me, that, again, this is my opinion, but then there's contemporary musical theater, which is post-60s, uh, so that would be Bach and Harnick, uh, Malby and Shire, Aarons and Flaherty, William Finn, um, Kander and Ebb, those kinds of folks. To me, that's contemporary musical theater. Then there's, to me, kind of a divi there's two divisions of contemporary musical theater. They're contemporary in the sense of that they are of the day, but they're different in style. And one would be the pop music theater, which would be composers whose heads are really in the pop world or rock world, but yet they're composing a score for the musical theater. So Elton John, Frank Wildhorn, Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, uh, Jonathan Larson, you know, their heads are really in pop rock song forms, but yet they're composing a score for the music theater. So I really separate that as a pop music theater selection. Uh, and then there's what I call the new contemporary composers, which would be Jason Robert Brown, Adam Gettle, Michael John Lacusa, Andrew Lippa, all those kinds of people, and who are writing just some magnificent stuff, but it's, it's different than your normal, you know, com contrast that with Kander and Ebb or Maltby and Shire, and it's very different. And so I think you, I always tell people to, to know your audition and to know if that kind of new contemporary material fits in to what you're doing. You know, because if, if, if somebody's asked for a contemporary music theater selection, you know, singing How the Glory Goes from Floyd Collins might not be the best choice. You know, it might not be what they want to hear as much as I love the song and I'd listen to it all day. It still might not be the best choice, you know. And then the last section is really what I call pop rock songs. And if I say pop rock song, I'm really talking about something that was or is on the radio. So I think that's the definition. It says, please sing a pop rock or country song which I really kind of lump them all together. You know, I mean something that was or is on the radio, not Superstar, not Chess. You know, I want a radio song, you know? And so to me, those are the divisions. I think dress code uh, depends on the project and it depends on the performer. It seems like maybe a hint of the world of the play is a good way to go. Um, but costumes aren't a good way to go. Um, so if you're coming in for Mary Poppins, um, perhaps something you know more formal, maybe a, a skirt and a top, or um, not lace-up boots and an umbrella. Um, <laughs> so I think I think a hint of something is good, and not um, not no nothing too obvious. And also, if you're coming in for something that's very contemporary, or if like you're coming in for a character who's really hip, uh, maybe let us know through your clothing choice that you too are hip. And the reverse. Yeah.
I totally agree with that about costumes at an audition. Not a good idea. <laughs> Same thing with props, by the way. Um, but I do want to say that I think one of the most important things that actors sort of should remember while intimating the feel of whatever it is they're auditioning for is that they really need to be comfortable in their own skin mm -hmm. and they need to feel good about how they look and what they're wearing and so when women come in shoes that they're wearing for the first time or men dress in a way that they very rarely dress in real life I think that they need to figure out a way to feel comfortable with that so that that's not something that's on their mind so that they're not worried about that there's so many other things you know to to be concerned about that the dress really should sort of feel like second second skin to them mm -hmm. um i think first of all joy of dancing is the first thing that that stands out in an audition is if somebody really loves what they're doing, not with attitude, but with true, genuine joy, that stands out. Um, and then after that, interpretation of music, um, the, the, the finesse of when you give an audition step, if they, they interpret exactly what you're saying on their body. It's really a translation. Can you take the words and what you see visually and put it on your body and make it look better, even? Better than anything I came up with. Because you're the muse. You know, you're really, I see it on my body, but you know, like Susan Stroman's a perfect example of a choreographer who, who choreographs for very tall people. She loves tall people, and she's not particularly a tall woman, but, you know, so they, they interpret it into their body and that that's what she wants. Yeah. Nowadays, it's not enough to be a triple threat anymore. Having said that, tumbling is very useful, but there may be... 10% of people that really tumble, and if you are not a tumbler and you don't have the training, if there's something else that you can do, as long as you have some other skill to contribute, you don't have to be a tumbler. It, and you should not be walking into an audition trying to do tricks that you don't have because it's extremely dangerous. Also, you need to define what tumbling is. A lot of people say they have tumbling or gymnastics on their resume, and then I stand in the room and I say, okay, who, who has tumbling? Who can tumble? The hands go up. Okay, you, what can you do? Um, I can do a cartwheel. Okay, cartwheel is not tumbling. A cartwheel is a cartwheel. You learn how to do it when you're five. That's not tumbling. Tumbling is back handspring, back tuck. Minimum. So if you're going to put tumbling on your resume, make sure you actually leave the ground at some point. The biggest problem people have with auditions, well, there are a couple, actually. I think one of the biggest problems is selection of material, picking the wrong song for the wrong audition. They're picking something, and it's just not what I would want to hear for that audition. It's singing, the obvious thing would be singing a rock song for a Rodgers and Hammerstein audition, or vice versa. It sounds so obvious, but I see people who say, I say, what'd you sing? I, why'd you sing that? Or singing what I call loser songs, songs that present them in a negative light. I think they've got to sing songs that present them positively. One of the other biggest things that I see is at some point in their audition, they're going away from their determined objective and they're thinking, gee, I wonder if I have to do my laundry tonight. Do I have a date tonight? Or, worse than that, we see them writing something behind the table and they're, they're acting going, wow, she's writing something. I bet she's writing about me. Wow, I wonder what she says. I wonder if I'm going to get a call back. And especially if you're good, if you're good at your audition, the minute you go away, we're like, and he's gone. What'd you do? And we're behind the table going, Shoot, I wish he could have stayed focused because it's the ability to stay focused on your objective and stay in character for the entire song. That's probably the biggest thing. Another thing that people do, they say 90% of people in auditions find some reason to apologize in their audition. I'm sorry that my dog ate my homework. I'm sorry I left my music at home. I'm sorry it's in the wrong key. I'm sorry I have a cold. I have a cough. I'm sick. I'm sorry I'm late for the audition. Don't apologize. You know, the best way to deal with nerves, again, is, is to really be positive of what you're doing before you walk in that room. When people are nervous in front of a group of people, it's because they don't know what they're doing. So if you're, if you're fudging it, faking it, or hoping, when I say crossing your fingers and hoping for the best when you walk in the room, you're going to be nervous, but you're nervous for good reason. So what you need to do is get your skill level high and your nerve level low, and uh, that takes some practice and some work. There's no magic potion 
to take right before you go in. But I think the other thing is, you know, when you're outside in that hallway and you're waiting to go in, uh, especially the dancers, you know, if you guys have just danced and there's, you know, there were 300 people in the room and they cut it down to 30 and now there's 30 dancers out in the hall. You know, dancers are famous for, they're so concentrated when they're dancing and then it comes to their singing and their concentration goes right out the window. So when you're waiting out in that hallway, whether you're a singer, or an actor, a dancer, whatever you think your strength is, you know, quietly concentrate on what it is you need to do when you walk in that room. Don't engage in conversation with people. Don't do small talk because then when they call your name, you're going to be a nervous wreck. and You're going to run in that room going, oh my God, I'm not really ready. I wasn't thinking my name was coming up. It's like, well, be outside and be peaceful with yourself. Be focused and concentrated so that when they call your name, you can quietly, confidently, and with a sense of peace, walk into that room and share your skill with people because that's what auditioning is. This whole thing about nervousness, also what happens is people say, oh, I'm not really that nervous. I'm a little nervous or I'm, you know, what I always say to people, look, if you're 10% nervous, you're 100% nervous because you're 10% nervous, the other 90% you're worried about your nervousness. So whatever percent nervous you are, uh, there's really no in between. You're probably 100% nervous. Now that said, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of uh, jittery anticipation. Um, but in reality, if auditioning causes you such distress that you're you know, going to feel sick all the time and you can't get over it, it's not an unfair thing for you to think about perhaps doing something else with your life because this is what we have to do all the time. So if it's going to upset you so much, you know, as I say, you know, could you imagine if your surgeon was you know, upset at the sight of blood? Not a good thing. You know, probably shouldn't be a surgeon. So um, same thing with performers. If you're going to be that nervous when you perform in front of people, you have to really look at that and maybe there's another you know, place for you in the business. Maybe your talents lie elsewhere. Maybe you're sort of you know, barking up the wrong tree. There's a bunch of ways, you know, showcase at the end of school. You know, if you go to a school that all the agents attend the showcase, you know, it, is incredibly important. Researching those schools, knowing which schools have the strongest programs that all of those showcases are attended. Recommendations. Most agents who love their clients will trust their clients and if a client says, you know, I have this buddy who's really talented, would you meet them? They want their client to be happy and since they like that person, there's a chance that they will like the other person. They might not have a place for them. Places like one-on-one, -on -one, Actors Connection, TBI, anywhere that you can actually get in front of somebody and do work for them. As long as your work is actually really ready to be seen and you're super confident and you're right and you're ready for what they have that's coming up, you're right for the, there's a, it's called the stable of clients. I know it sounds terrible, but it's, it's, a, it's a term. And if, you're, if they don't have anybody like you and they're a stable of clients, it doesn't matter where they find you. You know, if you're good, you're good. You know, so there are so many different ways you can go about doing that. Recommendations, workshops, showcases are really the best ways to go about doing it. The most common mistake that people make is they forget about business meals and business gifts. Business meals are drinks, coffee meals with anyone in your profession, including networking, where you discuss your career, which for most actors is almost every person they know. And you have to be reasonable about it. You come in, you make 30000 you tell me I spent $8,000 on business meals. I'm going to say no, that's just not reasonable. But that is a starting point. Don't bring me $50. I know you spent more than that if you were in New York City. That's just not a normal number. It may be truthful, but it would be very a very odd number. Likewise, any opening night flowers, any gift that you give to an agent, a casting director, the, you know, the, the choreographer in your show, any wine that you took over to a fellow actor's or um, house for dinner or for scene study or anything like that, those are business gifts. And they're limited to $25 per person per year, but people regularly overlook those. People don't keep their taxi receipts. Um, going to an audition is deductible. If you're can deduct an expense going to that expense you can deduct meaning if you went to Staples to buy a toner for your cart for your printer that is a deductible taxi ride 
Going to an audition is a deductible tax, right? Going to the theater is a deductible tax, right? Because that is research. It's going to a meal with a fellow actor. So that's a, 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 over, a much overlooked one, too. Sing Strong! Productions.